you, God, that today, as we open up your eternal word, God, you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Truly today, Lord, we have not come to hear from a man or a woman, young or old, black, white, brown, or any color we could imagine. We came to hear from you. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your instruction, your direction, even the correction where we've gotten off track. Get us back on track with you, Lord. And Father, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves only. Oh, no, Lord. We'd ask it for all the churches here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapels. God, we bless Harvest and Oak Valley, Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, The Way and Citizens and Sandals and Elevate Life and C3 God, Rock Church of Temecula, all the great churches that are out there are Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters, the four square denominations, evangelical free churches, God. Lord, if they're preaching your gospel truth, lifting up your name, we bless them just as you would bless us. Bless the persecuted church scattered abroad throughout the nations. Watch over them, protect them. May they endure to the end, God. We lift it to you, our brothers and sisters in nations where uh, they're having government sanctions and they're not able to gather at these times, Lord, or maybe they're gathering in smaller groups, Lord God. Bless their fellowship. May they continue to press on, Lord, in the midst of these difficult times, God. I pray for the churches in Nashville. God, all those that have been decimated by these terrible tornadoes, God, we pray, Lord, that the church would shine the light of Jesus during this dark time and that you would encourage and strengthen our brothers and sisters there. Father, it's in Jesus' mighty name. We're all in agreement. We say amen. 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 As you're having a seat, get your Bibles out and go with me to Colossians, the fourth chapter. We are headed towards the end of the book of Colossians. Been in the book of Colossians for a number of years now, going line upon line and precept upon precept. We've made our way to Colossians chapter number four, and last time we read verse seven through the end of the chapter, and we started a series called The Lord's Work and Workforce. And I just want to remind you of some of the things that we said in part number one, because some of you guys maybe weren't here, maybe already you've forgotten what we talked about. Last time when we were together, we learned that the Lord's work is for all of us, that it's not just for the pulpit ministers, not just for those paid by the church, but we all have a part in doing the work of the Lord. Let me just ask this question right up front, and I want to hear a great big shout, a whoop and a holler, and I want to see your hands up in the air and waving just like you don't care, right? How many full-time ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ do we have in this place today? There you are. All right, good. I'm glad that you guys understand that because the Lord's work is for all of us, not just preaching, not just studying the Word, not just praying with people, but when you go out and when you do a great job for Jesus on the job, right, in the workforce, in the education systems, whether you're in politics or entertainment or whatever you're doing, that as you do that unto the Lord, that is your ministry. That is your work. We are a part of the Lord's workforce. Uh, Small things, when we do them and we place them in the hands of God, they become of great importance. Secular things become sacred. doesn't matter if you're sweeping streets. If you do it to the glory of God, that becomes a sacred and holy thing. And temporary things become eternal. We think that we're just doing a little job. I'm just doing something small. I'm just barely getting involved in the church or I'm just helping out in the community. And yet, when you place that in the hands of God, it becomes of eternal value. Today, I'd like to continue with these thoughts in mind and read once again the Scripture. This time I'm going to read Colossians chapter 4, verse number 7, and this time I'm going to stop in verse number 14 for what we're talking about today. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 7, starting out, says this. It says, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. Verse number 8, I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. Verse number 9, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, They will make known to you all the things which are happening here. Verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Verse number 11, and Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Verse 13, for I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Verse number 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. You know, it's very important who we surround ourselves with. The Bible is very clear that our lives will be impacted by the people that are around us. And I see the Apostle Paul had surrounded himself with a group of people. In fact, he names them, and I believe that that's why the Lord kept these names for thousands of years in the Scriptures, is so that we could see the type of people that the Apostle Paul surrounded himself with. And the Bible tells us that bad company will actually corrupt good morals. If we get around the wrong people, it will affect us negatively. But 
we're going to be around people in our lives. And in the ministry especially, we're going to be around people. Can I, can I just for a moment pull back the curtain on ministers for a second? I know you may not understand this fully, but just share with you some of the humor that ministers have, okay? It might be a little weird to you guys because you're like, well, I'm not, uh, you know, one of the ministers. But remember, you are a full-time minister, so you will understand this on some level. Somebody sent me this meme one time, and it said, who said pastoring a church is stressful? I'm 42 and feeling great. You know, looking at that, is that going to be me in two years? My goodness. Well, it does kind of look like me with the glasses and everything today. Okay, I get it. But, you know, it is a stressful job. Why? Because you're dealing with people. You're around them all the time, and people come with issues, problems. Many people that you get around, they have a mess that they made in their life, and we end up dealing with those messes. In fact, one of the common phrases at our Bible college when we were studying from our instructors was this, that the ministry would be great if it wasn't for the people. But how many of you know ministry is all about people? In fact, by definition, ministry means service for people. We're going to deal with messes. We're going to encounter problems and trials that people bring up, things that people do that they didn't have to do. And it's very important that as we're a part of the workforce of God, that we don't get discouraged or dragged down with these problems and these stressors and these stresses and things that come against us in the ministry, but rather that we surround ourselves with the right people who can help build us and encourage us and move us on to what God has for us. I believe that's why the Apostle Paul writes to these people and names them and mentions them is because he's showing that, hey, I've got a great group of people around me. How many of you know no person does it all on their own? There is a team of people that are working and laboring together. This church doesn't happen because Pastor Dan is so great or because Pastor Jim and Deborah were so wonderful as our founders. This church happens because thousands, not just hundreds, thousands of people every year put their hand to the plow and do something to build the work of the ministry here at the Rock Church. And in the same way, the Apostle Paul had a bunch of people around him. He wasn't planting churches by himself. He wasn't writing letters to the churches by himself. He had other people that were involved in the ministry with, with him. In fact, even the names of the people mentioned tell us a story because each of their names has meaning. You know, my name, Daniel, means God is my judge. My middle name, Harold, means leader of an army. You know when God names you that there's purpose that's given, there's destiny that's given. That's why he changed Abram's name, father, to Abraham, father of many. He was speaking destiny. He was speaking purpose. He was saying something about it. And so I did a quick study of what these names mean, and let me just read them to you and think about the type of people that are surrounding Paul just by definition of their name. Their names mean things like faithful, profitable, useful, the best ruler, a defense, son of encouragement, just, lovely, light-giving, and governor of the people. See, he was surrounded with people. Notice that there wasn't a single name in there that was called divisive. What a single person named discouraging. Wasn't a single person named gossip, slanderer, menace, he didn't have any of these names, darkness. He didn't have any of those things, downcast. None of those names were included. No, these were people that were builders. These were people that were encouraging. These were people that could help, people that he got encouraged when he was around them. In fact, one of them, Barnabas, bar meaning son of, now that's meaning encouragement, right? The son of encouragement. He kept that guy close. Why? Because anytime you get around Barnabas, man, you're going to be encouraged. We need these types of people in our lives as we're doing the work of the ministry. I want to make a statement. I'm going to put up on the overheads for you guys that are taking notes today. I want you guys to note this, that God's workforce should be helpful and encouraging. Pastor Dan, did I really come to church today to hear that God's workforce should be helpful and encouraging? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Why? Because sometimes we think that we have to go and study at seminary and get a degree and do all this hard stuff. We put all these hoops up to jump through in order for us to be able to do something for God. And yet God makes it so simple and so easy for us that we have no excuse not to do something. God's work for us should be, what should we be? Helpful and encouraging. Man, if we had a church full of helpful and encouraging people, you couldn't keep people out of the doors of this place. Why? Because when I go there, everybody's asking me, how can I help you? Hey, what can I do for you? Do you need anything? Right? And encouraging. Man, when you get around somebody that's encouraging, you almost find a reason to go get around them, don't you? It's like, man, I'm not feeling that good. Where's so-and-so at, man? Where's that Barnabas guy at? 
I need to get around them. Why? Because they build you up and you feel good. God's workforce should be helpful and encouraging. Over the next two weeks, I want to take a look at these two things, being helpful and being encouraging. Today, I just want to focus on that one word, helpful, helpful. The helpful people, the helpful workforce. These are the faithful people. These are the best rulers. These are the governors of the people. They'll be just profitable and useful in the ministry like their names say. And when we take on the heart of a helpful person, we realize that the ministry is not just there to benefit us, even though it does. All right? Now, there is a benefit to being in the ministry. You will get helped. You will be encouraged yourself. But the ministry is not just there to benefit us. When you're a helpful person, when you're part of the workforce and you say, I- I'm ready to help, then what you're doing is you're there to benefit the ministry because the ministry is for the people. And that's what this is all about is just saying, I want to help people. If you have that heart, how can I help? How can I get involved? What do you need? Well, what can I do? I had a lady walking out the back door just this past service, and she stopped me at the back door. She said, Pastor, how can I help? I said, go and just sign up right there. Just right at the information center, fill out the application. They'll get you going right there. Let's get going with the things of God. Because when we have that heart that's open, we have that heart that's submitted and says, God, I just want to be a helper of people. Man, God will come, and he will use you to do great and mighty things. But how many of you know that helping people often requires practical grace and mercy? Like I said, people come with problems. People come with issues. People come with hang-ups. People come with prejudices and biases. People come with things in a past and a history that may not be comfortable for us or things that we don't like. And so God says you're going to need practical grace and mercy when you're helping people. Turn to me the book of Philemon. Philemon, all right? We're there in Colossians. Turn back first and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, and you'll find a little teeny tiny book in the New Testament called Philemon. If you hit Hebrews, turn around and come back. You've gone too far, okay? If you hit maps, you've gone way too far. Come on back. Right before the book of Hebrews, you'll find the book of Philemon. Philemon is named after the man whom this letter is written to. He was a pastor. The Bible says that he held a church in his house. That often denoted that they had leadership. So when you hear greet so-and-so in the church that's in their house, that meant that they were most likely the pastor of that church. Philemon probably was the pastor of the church at Colossae, what we're reading about. And there was two letters that were delivered to the church at Colossae. One of them was the book of Colossians. Tychicus had that letter. But remember that Tychicus also came with a guy named Onesimus, all right? I'm probably murdering that name in the Greek, but I don't care. That's how I like to say it, so that's what we're going to go with today, all right? And so Onesimus comes with another letter, and that letter is the letter to Philemon. Now, it's very interesting to note that Onesimus carried this letter to Philemon because Onesimus was actually a runaway slave. And he ran away from his master named Philemon. So the runaway slave now is coming back, and he's handing a letter to the man that he ran away from. With that in mind, come on, there's some drama going on right now. There's some issues coming up right now. Let's take a look at what the Apostle Paul writes to Philemon. In Philemon, we're going to read verse number 10 through verse number 16. Look at what it says in Philemon, verse number 10. I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. Apparently, this runaway slave at some point met up with Paul in prison. And under Paul's ministry, he gave his heart and his life to the Lord. Verse number 11, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. He actually has a little play on words here because Onesimus means profitable. It means useful. And he says, once this guy was a slave, but he ran away and he was unprofitable for you. He might have stole from him. He might have damaged something and ran away. That might have been why he was running away from his master was because he was actually saying, uh, you know what, I got to get away because I damaged, I was unprofitable servant. And so Paul has a little play on words. He says, once he didn't bear the right name. He was unprofitable, but now, guess what? Onesimus is a good name for him. He's profitable both to you and to me. Verse 12, I'm sending him back. You, therefore, receive him. That is my own heart. You know, at the time in Rome, there were probably more slaves than there actually were Romans. And the Romans were starting to get afraid. There was an uprising in the first century, and so it was tumultuous times. People were on edge. And so the Apostle Paul, there in prison, Housing a slave, that would have been the wrong thing according to what society would have to say. And he, Paul says, I'm going to do the right thing. Now, we as Christians, we know that slavery is wrong. We know that God does not take pleasure in, in, in us owning another person, right? And so in our nation, thank God we've abolished that. Thank God there was emancipation. Thank God for those that have gone before us who worked for equality and those types of things in our nation today. 
And yet we still find ourselves on edge, don't we? Still find ourselves with race and class and those sorts of things. So Paul says, I'm going to do the right thing in the flesh, in the natural. I'm sending him back to you. I'm taking this person who was a slave, who ran away, and in the flesh, I'm sending him back to his fleshly master. But look at what he goes on to say, verse number 13. Whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my change for the gospel. Verse 14, but without your consent, I wanted to do nothing. That your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. He's saying, I'm not commanding you in my apostolic authority to do anything to release this slave and to give him back to me to help me in the ministry. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you the decision, finally, as a man of God, as a pastor, I'm going to share with you that this guy's now a brother in the Lord. He's gotten saved, and I want you to do the right thing here, finally. I'm trusting that you're going to make the right decision because I don't want it to be compulsory. I don't want to bend your heart, uh, your arm behind your back and make you do this. I want you to volunteer this good thing. Verse number 15, for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. Can I just share with you, while I was in my studies in my office this past Friday, And I was reading this word, and I got to this moment where I pictured Philemon and Onesimus looking at each other for the first time since he had ran away. And how Philemon was reading this letter, when I got to these words, receive him forever, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. It was like a rhema from God to me. I was just overwhelmed and tears flooded my eyes. Because can you imagine this, this man, Philemon, the emotions that were running through him? Probably a very wealthy man. If he was a slave owner, he probably had property. If he had a house that could house a church, he probably had a large house at that time. He may have been traveling when he encountered the Apostle Paul and gave his heart and life to the Lord, but he would have continued to do life in business. And there would have been a struggle that was going on on the inside of him. He was probably very angry with Onesimus. Because this was a runaway slave and he did some damage or stole something from him. And there would have been that hurt and that betrayal on the inside of him. And yet now he's looking at this man who betrayed him in the flesh, but recognizing and realizing that this guy, there's something different about him now. He's had an encounter with God and now he's coming asking for forgiveness and doing the right thing. There must have been something that was happening there. And he might have read that letter and saw this receive him forever. How could he receive him forever? We're not going to live forever in the flesh, right? No, but in the spirit we are. And that's where the next verse comes in. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave. A beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Notice how Paul elevates this slave from the position of property to a person. He says in the flesh first. Notice we all are born of Adam and Eve. Is that right? All of our lineage can be traced to Adam and Eve and to Noah and his sons. We all share a common blood. Our DNA all is shared. If you took a black man, a white man, a Mexican, an Asian, you took all the different cultures on the earth and you looked at our DNA, they would not be that different. Come on. You cut us open, we're all going to bleed red. But we are no longer the nations of the earth based on color and gender and and class and society and that sort of thing. Now we are one blood. The blood of Jesus binds us together. We are now one, not only in the flesh, but also in the Lord. And that's how we can receive one another forever. Because ministry is about the people. And even though Onesimus had issues, even though Philemon had issues, here the apostle says, set those things aside and help one another in the things of God. I see a couple of different ways that they're helpful. First way is this, is that if we're going to be helpful as the workforce of God, we need to help people with their salvation. Just like Paul helped both Philemon and Onesimus with their salvation, we need to be a people that's always looking to help people in their salvation. There's no greater help you're going to give someone than helping them along in their salvation. Is that right? We should be looking for those opportunities, those divine moments, those divine appointments, where we get to share the love of Jesus with someone. In fact, in the Bible, in the book of Jude, verse number 22 and 23, right before the book of Revelation, you'll find this little book, once again, bouncing around in little books today, but the book of Jude. And in Jude, there's only one chapter, but I want to take a look at verse number 22 and verse number 23, right towards the end of the book of Jude, verse 22, and some have compassion, making a distinction. Verse 23, but others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. 
What's he saying? He's saying that we need to understand that people need to be ministered to individually, personally. That people have a certain way that they're living their lives. And we need to make the distinction of how to minister to them. There are people who will not receive just a blunt, rude, crude, in-your-face type of a message. But we need to understand that they need compassion. They need mercy. They need love. They don't need us to criticize and judge them to death. No, they need us to love them to life. They need us to be compassionate and kind and tender with them. Why? Because they didn't have the opportunity we had. They didn't have the parents raising them up and telling them what was right and what was wrong. They don't know any better. They didn't have the word of God delivered to them in a great church like this. And so they're lost. They're broken. They're hurting. They're they're being beat up by the devil. And so they need us to come in tenderly and kindly and just to help them along with their salvation. But then the next verse, he said, but others, pull them right out of the fire. Can I say it like this in in modern day way? Jerk their swords. Just get a hold of them and snatch them out of the fire. Listen, guys, we need a rescue mission one yard from hell so that we can reach out as they're headed in, being stupid. We can, I need a ministry of slapping people, right? Bam, get out of there. Don't go to hell. What are you doing? You know that's not right. Some people need to hear it like it is. But they need our help in either of those instances. Some need compassion. Make that distinction. But others, man, saving them from the fire, saving them with fear, fear of God, fear of eternity in hell, fear of I don't want you to die and to go to hell. I want you to be able to be with Jesus for eternity. And can I love you enough to tell you the truth and get in your face? Come on, somebody. But also helping others in the church with their salvation. You know that salvation is not a one-time event where you pray a prayer and that's it. That's all it was, man. I'd have people just read this real quick, would you? All right, cool. You're saved. Just read this real quick. That's not it, though. God's no fool. He listens to our prayers, and then he watches our lives, sees into our hearts, and knows those that are his. And Jesus said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. The Bible tells us that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We all are on that narrow road headed to heaven, and so we need to help other people with their salvation. Even though they may be in church, even though they may be a Christian, they need our help continuing on in the things of God. James chapter 5, verse number 19 and 20, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, verse 20, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. You know, one of the biggest reasons why people that were on fire for God in church don't come back is because they fear the judgment of the Christians in church around them. They think, if I go back and show my face at that church, I'm going to be ashamed And rather than come in and receive love and forgiveness, they run and hide just like Adam and Eve in the garden. Where are you, Adam? I was afraid, so I hid. In the same way, when people mess up in church, we need to create an environment that turns them from our way. Hey, if you continue down that path, that leads to destruction. You should not be messing around in those things. You shouldn't be going to that place. You shouldn't be doing that. And the Bible says if we turn a sinner from their way, that's brethren, right? He started out with brethren. These are church people. He says, when you turn a sinner from their way, the air of their way, you will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. In other words, when they come in, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to continue on with the things of God. Let's combat that. Let's move forward with that. We've dealt with that. It's under the blood of Jesus, and now we are not going to start to criticize, condemn, to bring up old hat. We're not going to continue to browbeat people. Well, you're a sinner. I guess that's just what you're going to do, right? That's how you're going to continue. No. Hey, I'm so glad that you're back. I'm glad that you're here. Listen, we're going to grow in the things of God together. You need help while you change. I'm here to help you with your salvation. We need to help people with their salvation. Second thing is this, help them in practical ways. Just like the Apostle Paul was helping Onesimus in a practical way, right? Sending him back to his master, making restoration, reconciliation. Helping them get in the line with the things of God. In the same way, we need to take a look and find out practical ways to help people. Any of you guys ever done a foot washing ceremony? Okay, a couple of you guys. Isn't that like the worst thing, right? I, I just noticed that we've never done one of those at The Rock because, man, I just, I've done that. It's a great experience. It's humbling, but I don't need to be humbled all the time like that. You know what I mean? Like, I'll just take Jesus' example and just go, all right, Jesus. But what did he do? He gird himself with a towel. And he went and he washed, not people's feet that were in a sock and a shoe all day, because that's bad enough. Mm, toe jam, right? You know? None of us want that. But Jesus girded himself with a towel, and then he washed his disciples' feet. Now, they didn't have Nikes. They didn't have Adidas. They didn't have Reeboks. They had sandals. 
Can you imagine the calloused, nasty, dirty disciple feet, right? Fisherman feet. Who knows what kind of corns they had? Who knows what kind of funk they had, right? Animals doing their business all out in the street. They're just walking right through. And now here comes Jesus girding himself with a towel. And the Bible says that he washed their feet in a basin, and then he wiped their feet with the towel that he girded himself with. He took their filth upon himself. Think about this for a second. He washed Judas' feet. He washed the feet of his betrayer and took his betrayer's filth upon himself as well. He took the initiative, and he leaves us an example. I remember when I was on the mission field, we did one of those foot washing ceremonies, and afterwards, after a lot of giggles and laughs and yucks and all that kind of stuff, they, they said, now that you've done this, we want to induct you into the order of the towel. And they handed out these little tiny pieces of towels, and they said, we want you to pin these pieces to your shirt. We want you to get a hold of these little things. And I, I put mine, I had a necklace that I wore at the time, and so I put that little piece of a towel on the necklace that I wore. And they said, anytime somebody wants to ask you about this towel, hey, why do you wear that towel? What's that towel all about? We want you to not tell them what the towel is about, but just go and find a way to serve them. Just find a way to love them, just like Jesus. Follow his example. And so I would do that. Anytime someone would ask me, I'd go and I'd help them out, find some practical way to serve them. I remember one time I was at a McDonald's with somebody, and they were like, hey, what's the towel all about? I'm like, oh, it's nothing real quick. Just, just like the towel. And so, hey, can I take your tray? And so then I came back and said, no, really, come on, tell me what the towel is all about. I'm good. Listen, you don't need to know. Can I, can I refill your drink? Come on, tell me what the towel is all about. You need a napkin? And after a while, they caught on, and it, it was almost like a game to them. They just kept asking and asking and asking and asking. I'm running out of ways to serve them, you know what I mean? And finally, they got it. They said, you have to do something nice to me every time I ask you, don't you? Don't you? Don't you? I'm like, fine, shut up, yes. Knock it off, all right? Don't ask me again. Get out of here, you know? Well, eventually, I stopped wearing the towel, obviously, because you guys haven't seen me wearing the towel. Ask me at the back door, Pastor, what's that towel about? Well, can I get you some hand sanitizer, right, you know? I stopped doing that, but it became a part of my life. It became a part of my lifestyle so much so that I think that people can actually recognize it on me. Because now the question that people ask me is not why the towel, but people ask me a different question out there in the community and when I'm at the store and that sort of thing. You know what they ask me? Do you work here? All the time. My wife's over here at the front row. How many times has this happened? Do you work here? Everywhere, right? I'm at Target, guys. What do Target employees wear? Red polo shirt, khaki pants, right? I have gone to Target looking like this. Hello. Walking down the aisle. So, do you work here? My response now is, what do you need? Oh, you can't reach that shelf? Okay, here, I got you. That's why God gave me six feet, right? Because apparently, it's on me somehow in my makeup. People can sense it that this guy can help, and he has answers. And everywhere I go, people ask me, do you work here? My goodness, I was at a men's conference at another church one time. I went up to shake the minister's hand and tell me he did a good job. He said, here, can I give this to you? He handed me the microphone. I'm like, yeah, thanks. Good job, by the way. You know, like, because people just assume that I have answers and I can help. Why? Because I've just taken on the heart of a servant. I love what it says in Matthew chapter number 7, verse 12, in the message paraphrase. It says, here is a simple rule of thumb guide for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it for them. Add up God's law and the prophets, and this is what you get. You know, Jesus summarized the whole Old Testament when he said that. He's saying, you could study this all day long, and when you add up everything that you find in the Old Testament, all you get is just figure out what you would want done for you, and then go do that for someone else. Hey, how about this this week when it's rainy and when it's cold later on in the week? Would you want someone to bring you coffee in the morning? Thank you for the of course over there. Praise the Lord for that. Right? Of course. Don't be silly, Pastor. Right? So then what are you going to do? Go grab a coffee for someone else. Grab one for you, too, because you're a double portion. Come on, right? Get the venti. It's double blessings this year, right? And you go and you bring someone coffee. Hey, I just happened to be at Starbucks and got you a spiced caramel macchiato upside-down latte with a, a twist of soy and a, and a lime in it, right? That's what I like, so. But what do you want done for you? You want people to be nice to you? 
Of course, right? Then be nice to somebody. Would you want someone to help you if you were struggling carrying a box in a door? Would you want someone to open the door for you? Yeah, then figure it out. Learn what you want done for you, and then start looking for opportunities to help someone else. Hey, let me get that door for you. Hey, are you struggling with this? I, I can see a perplexed look on your face. Can I help you with a problem? You want to bounce an idea off me right now? And just start to offer assistance. It will catch on that you are the one to go and ask for help. And you'll be busy. You'll be blessed. People will be searching you out, trying to find you, all because the workforce of God should be helpful. Last thing is this, last thing is this, and i got to run. Help restore them, help restore them. Sometimes people need a, 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 an extra help when it comes to restoration. Not just turning one from the air of their ways. That's wonderful, and we need to do that. We need to help people with their salvation. But as well, to get people back to a place of restoration, right? Wholeness and healing. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Guys, can I tell you this? We are our brother's keeper. We should be looking out for others. And when we see people involved in the wrong things, turn them from the air of their ways, but also help get them restored, help get them healed, help get them encouraged and built up in the things of God and blessed to where they're back to where they need to be. Walk with them through that process and love them while they change and while they learn and while they grow and while they make mistakes. Pick them back up and dust them off and, and teach them the ways. Show them what God showed you. And the Bible says to do that with a spirit of gentleness, not harshness, not abrasiveness, not browbeating. No. That, that we should consider that we also could be tempted. You know what I mean? When I take a look at being a pastor, there are other pastors who have fallen into grievous sins. Don't think for a moment that I'm not very aware of that when I help other people or when I preach the word, that I also could fall into sin. And so when I'm helping other people, I'm aware that, hey, guess what? I need to keep myself right. And so I'm going to be gentle with other people. Why? Because I would want them to be gentle with me if I were in the same position and the same condition. And, and we need to help people and lift them up. And the Bible says, bear one another's burdens. And we should have a heart of compassion that reaches out and loves people and lifts them and elevates them. Very interesting to me in the story of Philemon and Onesimus that we don't get from the Scriptures whatever happened. We don't know whether or not Philemon really did what the Apostle Paul asked him to do. But history does record that there is a man by the name of Onesimus that eventually became the bishop over the churches of Ephesus. Now, Paul, we know, sent Timothy to be the pastor over the church at Ephesus. Timothy probably had 75,000 people in the churches that he oversaw. And who would be trusted to take that ministry on in the future? Maybe it could be that Philemon indeed did do more than the apostle asked him. And maybe he did restore and receive this one and bring him up and teach him his pastor, teach him the way, and sent him back to Paul to help in the ministry. And maybe Onesimus got raised up and elevated and brought up so that the one who is now uh, the guy who ran away to become his own master had met up with the true master, Jesus Christ. And because he just said, I'm going to serve, I'm going to submit. I'm going to just be helpful that he was received, he was restored, and he was reached up into the things of God to be elevated to be a bishop over the church at Ephesus. Wow. Isn't it amazing the things that God can do? doesn't matter if you're a beat up, a broke up, a runaway. If you feel like, you know, you were just kind of somebody's lazy leftovers, God is saying to you, listen, you have a help. You have the helper. You have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You have something to give. You have something to add. You can do it. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Verse 6, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. We need to help people. We need to be helpful. The body of Christ, the workforce of God, should be helping people with their salvation, helping them in practical ways and helping to restore them. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word today, God. We receive it with meekness. God, we're so grateful that you allow us the help that we need, and as well that we can be a help to others. We can help people in their road and their journey to salvation, help people in practical ways. God, open our eyes to see those things that we would want done for us, and that God will grab the initiative and we'll do it for them. And Father, we can help to be a part of your body, 
helping to restore people. Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. While we're here in this holy moment, let's not just rush out of the presence of God. I just want to take a moment and ask you, what is God speaking to you? Maybe you want to turn that into a prayer and say, God, what are you saying to me? Is God asking you to help someone with their salvation? It could be as simple as telling someone that Jesus loves them. Or as complex as setting up an appointment for lunch, sharing the gospel. What's God speaking to you? Maybe there's some practical things God put on your heart to help someone out, to offer assistance. Maybe he's saying that you need to get involved here at the church. Put your hand to something and just say, how can I help? What's God speaking to you? If there's somebody that you know is caught up in a trespass, they're wandering away from the things of God, and God wants to use you to help restore them. Maybe there's somebody that's not sitting here, and you know it's not just because it's daylight savings time. You haven't seen it for weeks in church. And you need to reach out. And let them know you're going to walk with them through that process of restoration. What is God speaking to you? commit that thing to the Lord right now. Father, we take those things that you've committed to us. We commit them right back to you, Lord. We ask, God, that you'd empower us by your grace to fulfill the ministry that you've given to us, our calling, our individual and personal callings, Lord God, things that you would have us to do. Lord, we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that will speak on our behalf, that will prompt us to do those good works that you've called us to do, to be your vessels of encouragement, healing, and help for the people that you surround us with. We love you, Lord, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Everybody in agreement said, amen. Come on, if you got something for the word of the Lord today, would you give God a great big praise? Hallelujah.